Coach, I guess when we talked to you the week prior to when everything went down, you knew you were in the hot seat, but were you surprised by the timing and was it unexpected? Well, you know, the thing, Van, even when we brought up the hot seat, you know, that's a, a glamorous term that we all like to use. And as I said then, um, there's no amount of pressure that could equal the amount of pressure that any coach, not just myself, uh, puts on himself to put a product out on the field that's successful. So, I mean, and, and I said it then and I, I, I live by it today. You know, I can sleep good at night knowing that uh, I did the best job I could possibly do to put a product on the field uh, that our fans and that our boosters and, and our former lettermen could be proud of. And at night, if you know you've done everything you could from that part, the things that you could control, uh, then so it be. But did the timing, like, I mean, the big rivalry game, New Mexico State coming up, did that catch you by surprise? No, you know, I, I'm a, I'm, as I said, I'm an optimist, Van, and, you know, anytime, obviously, when you lose to a lower division school, which we did on homecoming, uh, the loss to Sam Houston, uh, no doubt, as I said at the press conference, was unacceptable. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, but it's where the program was or where the program is. Um, and, and there's really no, nothing you can do to control it other than do the things to try to put your team in position to win. Um, the timing of it, you know, there is no perfect timing, obviously, for uh, being let go, which is a humbling experience. Um, you know, whether it's state game this week or the end of the year, uh, I don't think there is a perfect timing. And, you know, I was the guy that kind of was the aggressor in trying to find out where are we going. You know, I placed the call to Paul. I didn't sit back and wait. Um, you know, I thought it was important, especially going into the state game. And, and I always put the players first. I thought it was important for me to be able to have an idea of how I needed to proceed to keep the team together, to be able to continue the process that uh, we started. This whole thing, you know, from the time you walked in the door, it was, it, it was you know, a little topsy-turvy a little bit. You know, you had the big, nice press conferences. And then after that, it's just like it seems like there was one thing after another. Do you feel like you were treated fairly here? Well, you know, that's fairly is, a, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I, I know this, uh, contrary to what some others may have said in terms of you know, and referencing if they knew then what they know now, um, things they would have done things differently. From my standpoint, I don't live with regret. Um, it was a short honeymoon. Um, was I prepared for that? No, no coach uh, would be. I, I thought that there was an understanding of the, the people that supported the program as to where the program really was. Um, I came in, uh, I took the baton and ran with it. And uh, I did just about everything that was asked of me to try to move the program forward. Um, to say whether or not I was treated fairly or unfairly, it, re it really doesn't matter now. Um, the thing that I want to leave here with is that, you know, I'm more concerned with my character than I am my reputation because the character of, is who you really are. Your reputation is what others think of you. And, um, you know, I think I came here uh, with a pretty impeccable character. Um, I'm leaving here probably with my reputation a little tarnished. Is that upsetting for you to, uh, to think all the hard work you put in as far as building up your character and your reputation, building up your reputation, that is, and now you leave this place and you feel like it's tarnished? No, I mean, again, uh, I'm not a woe is me guy. Uh, I, I, I take control, uh, complete accountability for where I am today. I mean, there's nobody to point a finger at uh, besides myself. There's nobody, again, that I... I I don't live with the regrets of, hey, do you wish you wouldn't? No, I'd do it again tomorrow. Um, you know, but I do think if there's anything uh, that's been disappointing or disturbing to me is that you know, who Mike Loxley really is, which is my character, uh, isn't necessarily portrayed by the reputation I've pretty much uh, been given uh, during my time here. And you know, I work really hard to uh, continue to work on my character. I can't do anything about the reputation. What were you, what was going through your mind when all that stuff was going on? You know, like when the, the, the suit at the beginning and, and uh, you know, the, the J.B. Gerald thing, all these things started happening. What, what were you thinking and, and being a, a first-year head coach? Well, I mean, I think the big thing, Van, and I've said this before, you know, everything happens for a reason. I mean, if it wasn't for my faith and, and my belief in that, in that alone, uh, obviously I'd be a little stir-crazy, but, you know, when you look at the things, and, and I heard them termed 
uh, black eyes to the program or off the field incidents, which is oftentimes or was oftentimes used. None of the things that were said about me were ever substantiated. Um, if they were supposedly fact, uh, the university would have had every opportunity prior to this past weekend to let me go. Um, you know, I feel as though that, you know, the things, if, if they weren't substantiated, then how do they continue to be associated with me? Um, that I have no control over. And as I said uh, at a million press conferences, I'm only going to worry about the things I have control over. And what I had control over is how I responded uh, to some of the, the claims or some of the black eyes as, the, as it's been deemed um, by the powers of B, how I responded to them. And the way I responded is the way I'm responding right now. I'll take the high road. I know I did things the right way. Um, it's absurd to to think uh, of some of the things that I've been accused of that, uh, that, that they're true. And if they were true, um, this, this conversation would have taken place a long time ago. Do you feel like you were ever embraced fully by this community or do you feel like there was some, there, that it, it didn't happen that way, that, that maybe you felt like you were never fully embraced? No, I mean, there are some key people. And again, I wanna make sure I do this, man. There's some people that I've gotta thank and apologize to, um, all in the same breath. The Board of Regents, for their belief in me, a guy like Jamie Cook, who's been a, a very staunch supporter of me through all of the, the good times, the tough times. Uh, President Schmidtley, obviously, uh, uh, he's the main reason that I even came here. Uh, his vision for where he saw athletics uh, integrated, in the, in the, integrated into academics played a pivotal, pivotal role. You know. I had choices just like the university did on whether or not to come or not to hire. And uh, I, I embraced it from the day I came. Uh, whether I felt embraced, I mean, I thought that there were, again, some extenuating circumstances that maybe uh, took away from uh, everyone being able to totally buy into what I was doing or what we were trying to get done with the program. Obviously losing a guy and replacing a legend. You know, I, I happened to be at Florida when we replaced a guy like Steve Spurrier. And, you know, I use Rocky Long in the same light here at New Mexico as uh, Steve Spurrier was at, at Florida. You know, Rocky was a tough guy to replace because uh, he, he, he was one of our own. Um, he's a guy that played here, uh, a guy that took the program to an, another level. And um, those were some of the reasons why I took the job. So whether or not I felt embraced from the start, yeah, I thought so. But I also thought that there was a wait and see attitude and obviously uh, with the Honeymoon being very short-lived with some of the black eyes, as we like to call them, uh, outside of the football part. You know, I can deal with and I can handle the accountability of being 2-26. and 26. I've said that from day one. And, you know, when you hear and, and see some of the things written or said as to whether or not you're an accountable guy, I think part of my character is being accountable. You have, you, you talk to, you say uh, the word, when I hear black eyes on the program and different things like that, and the, the two and 26 record, it brings me to the next thought I have about your harshest critics. You know, uh, college football, there's a certain way they do things as far as contracts go. You have a $750,000 buyout and, and uh, your record wasn't one that you wanted it to be, you know, it wasn't uh, exactly a winning record, you know, the two and 26, but you're still getting the buyout and, and people scream about it and they, they're upset about it. Do you deserve that? Well, again, it's not about whether it's deserved or not. It's contractual law. Uh, as I said prior, uh, I, had, uh, I had other things that I could have done besides take the job. And I took the job. And obviously, it's up to the people that I leaned on, uh, my agent, Trace Armstrong, a creative artist association, uh, to, to ensure that contractually uh, I'm taken care of. You know, at no point did we try to hold the university or this state hostage. Part of the reason why we even uh, entertained uh, renegotiating or restructuring the buyout. I could have easily said no, walked away, and taken the money that would have been owed to me last year if, in fact, the powers that be had decided to make a change at the end of last year. Uh, there was no twisting of my arms. There were no, if you take the buyout, we'll give you another year. Those conversations never took place. Uh, and so, as I said before, being accountable, I mean, by no means that I want to hold this state, this university hostage if they didn't think uh, 
I was the right fit or, or whether or not they wanted to support me as the head coach, which is why we did the things we did in our contracts. And, you know, some people say, well, why would you do it? And again, it goes back to who I am as a person and my character, not because uh, uh, I'm some guy that's trying to take the state of New Mexico to the bank. This place gave me an opportunity that not a lot of places give coaches uh, like myself. And, you know, for, for that, I'll forever be indebted uh, to the people, the board of trustees or board of regents, uh, Dr. Schmidley, and a slew of other big time supporters of Lobo football who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years that have had to weather and endure some of the things that I've had to. So for that, again, I say thank you and I apologize. So you, you felt like you, because of the way things were going, you felt like maybe I should renegotiate this thing at the uh, end of last year. Is that right? Or Well, I, I thought that there were some things that could be done in my contract. Uh, number one, to show, to show uh, from an outsider looking in that uh, I'm not here to hold this place hostage. I mean, I could have very well laid and, and lived with the, the contract agreement that we had coming in the front door. Uh, but I also am a person that, you know, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm not wanted, uh, where I'm not appreciated. And I never got that. Uh, I will say that I never felt that way from, from the administration. Um, I do feel there were some, again, extenu extenuating circumstances that surrounded me, that things were just completely out of my control that maybe I was being held accountable for that reflected in the support that people chose to give the, the football program. As far as this program goes, when you came in, do you feel like you really had the pieces needed to, um, I know that when you came in, you said I, you were always uh, being uh, optimistic about things. Yes. Was it, was the pro program in worse shape than you thought it was when you came in? Or, or were there pieces in place where you feel like, hey, we can pick the ball up and start running? No, I mean, obviously, Van, when you come into a place that's on three years of probation with limited scholarships, uh, you know, I was inheriting a team that had just finished four and eight. Um, you know, the litmus for the t amount of talent in the program is how many guys go to the NFL. You know, we had one guy drafted in my two and a half years. Another guy signed as a free agent who ended up being a starter uh, this year. Um, I understood what I was getting into. I don't think that it was always uh, put out there exactly where the program was. But as I've said before, you know, 2-26 and 26 is where it was. Um, I don't see that there was anything differently we could have done other than to allow the, the maturation of a program. I mean, there's tons of programs that have gone through what the Lobo Nation and the Lobo football program has gone through. You look at a place like a Florida State that – for years and years, just uh, were the cream of the crop, and then they fall off for two, three years, and now they start their upward swing. Um, you know, I'll go to bed at night again, believing and knowing that uh, Lobo football is in better shape today, as I sit here, than it was on December 8th when I accepted the position uh, as head coach. Uh, we navigated it through a, a three-year NCAA probation period. Uh, we've turned the roster, per se, and, and have brought in uh, some great talent, though it be young. And, and that's the maturation process that all programs have to go through. Uh, I'm not the first coach to be fired, won't be the last coach to be fired. Uh, when you get into this business, and I think I said it at my opening press conference, coaches are hired and the only thing they can do after the minute they're hired is to be fired. And uh, when you go to bed knowing that you put in, again, we put in the time. You know, I know a lot of times you hear people allude to the amount of money we make as coaches and uh, how much money a guy gets. And well, I can tell you this, when you put the amount of hours that we put into it, um, and if you ask some of the wives that are involved with coaches, uh, they'll tell you, uh, I trade in any amount of that money to uh, regain the character that I lost coming here, uh, to leave here knowing that I did things the right way. I mean, to, give a, uh, to give my son's best friend a car, all of a sudden he becomes a recruit, he makes a mistake, which 18 to 22 year old kids do, and next thing you know it's a news story that a uh, guy, uh, a young recruit is driving a car owned by Coach Loxley and gets a DUI. Those things I can't control. Uh, I wish I could. Set the record straight on that whole thing because, you know, there's been stories that he's a recruit and stories that he's Miko's best friend. 
What's, well, what's the deal? You know, Josh is a, is a family friend. I've known Josh since he was a seventh grader. Uh, Josh was not a recruit of UNM. He wasn't brought here to play football. Josh was here uh, visiting my son, Miko Loxley, who happens to be one of his close friends from, again, middle school uh, back in Champaign, Illinois. Josh, like any other 18, 19 year old kid, obviously made a mistake in, uh, in driving, number one, without a license, uh, number two, uh, any traffic offense involving alcohol uh, is not, is, you shouldn't do it. Um, I think like any kid, uh, maybe he thought if he did, I don't know the facts behind it, maybe he thought using my name would help get him out. and uh, Obviously it didn't and it caused probably a little more uh, a little more trouble, not just for himself, but for the program. And again, it's one of those uh, black eyes, as I heard it called uh, uh, numerous times, uh, for the program that here I am coaching a ball game. I have no idea uh, who's using Miko's truck. The truck wasn't listed in my name at all, but uh, for whatever reason, all night long it was registered under my name. It's registered under Miko Loxley, along with my wife. But again, I. I those are things that, uh, as a head coach, as a father, it can happen to any of us, but it came at a bad time, obviously. When that happened, did, do you think that had anything to do with you being released after that? I mean, was that the last straw type of thing? Do you think that played a part? Well, that's hard to say because I wouldn't dare. You know, My son, who I love dearly, uh, is devastated by the fact that, you know, to think that maybe he played a role. And, you know, 2-26 and 26 is 2-26. and 26. Uh, would I have been able to survive through the season? Who knows? Probably. Uh, losing to a lower level school like Sam Houston obviously is a, a tough loss to swallow. And as I told the staff uh, the night after the game, um, if I was the boss, I would fire me because, you know, our program should be bigger than uh, losing to. And this is, again, not to take any credit away from Sam Houston because uh, Coach Fritz and his staff did a tremendous job. They had a great game plan. They did the things it takes to win the game. But our program should be a little further ahead than uh, losing at home to a lower division uh, 1AA program. And, and, and that's the nature of the beast. And unfortunately, as a coach, you can provide the resources. You can put them on the field. Uh, but as I've said many a times, when your livelihood is controlled by 18 to 22-year-olds doing the things you ask them to do, those are some of the ramifications of it. And, Again, I wouldn't trade it in for the world. I love coaching. I enjoyed uh, every minute of seeing the development of this team. I do think that this team is on solid footing and has a solid foundation for the next person to come in here. Uh, should the kids in the program decide to stay, which I will strongly encourage them. It's a great place, a great institution for these guys to, to get a degree to go on and play great football. And uh, I, I think if they do decide to stay in the system, uh, they will have the success that we wanted when we came in as a program. Speaking of them starting to stay, I mean, I know you have close relationships with some of these guys. Some of them came here just because you were here. Do you think that we're gonna see a mass exodus of players? I hope not, Van. You know, I'll do everything I can in my power to keep these guys here. I've had numerous phone calls and obviously, you know, for me, this is, as I said before, it's very humbling to be let go. And it's really the first time in my career that this has happened to me. I've been on staffs that have been let go, but I was always uh, a guy that was kept on for whatever reason. Um, and so having seen what happens when decisions like this are made, it initially starts out very emotional for the players. And, and that part is because of the relationships you develop and build, which are the relationships that allow you to have success as well. But I think that... Uh, as things temper down, um, if they go out and, and bring in a guy uh, that has a, a reputation, uh, whether it be offensively, defensively winning, you know, again, I'll do everything in my power to ensure these guys stay uh, and finish their careers as Lobos. Um, you know, some may have come because of me, but I've always uh, put it out there that, hey, you don't choose a school just because of the coach, and that includes me. Uh, you need to come here because you think it's the right situation for you. And, and, and I think it is. And so uh, I hope that these guys do stay because if there's any silver lining and a difficult transition for me would be to see these guys be successful here in the near future uh, to at least validate that we brought in the right kind of kids. And maybe it was part coaching, uh, 
some of it systematic or systemic uh, as to where the program is today as we speak. But any program grows and matures, and if these players stay and the program matures like we expected it to, it's on really solid footing. How high can they go? I mean, could this become a TCU or Boise State? Because you look at the population base, it's kind of a similar situation with a team like Boise. And, and, and uh, how, can, can New Mexico do that, do you think? I still believe that you can do it here. I've obviously shown that you can recruit nationally to Albuquerque, though I'm not always sure that that, that, that type of recruiting has been embraced. Uh, we've always, again, started our recruiting here in state. I think some of the limits we had placed on us in recruiting maybe hurt the uh, relationships with uh, our staff and some of the local coaches uh, because we didn't have the ability to necessarily take chances on some kids that may not be ready or as developed as players right now, which is obviously the case we have to deal with right now. And very few coaches are given the opportunity to, to build it the right way. And so with some of the limitations we had in recruiting, I think it affected some of the decisions we made on some local prospects. But I do know that this place is a great place to recruit to. Um, I do believe the fan base, if they buy into you or if they accept you and they, they uh, believe in you, they'll show up and support the product. I do believe there's some good product in the program as we speak. And this year, with this being the first year to fully recruit a full class, uh, somebody's going to walk into the door of a place that has some talent still has some needs that have, are left because of the probation that we went through, some depth issues on the both fronts, the O-line, D-line. Um, but there, there's definitely, as I said, I feel like it's in better shape today than it was when I came in. And as a coach, that's all you really could ask. First year as a head coach, very uh, uh, first time as a head coach, uh, had you know all kind of stuff go on and, and you had some good times, bad times. Uh, what did you learn from being a head coach for the first time? Well, I think I learned to rely very heavily on your faith. Um, again, a lot of times when you're coming up the ranks as an assistant, um, you tend to rely on yourself and you tend to rely that, hey, I will be able to do this. But I learned pretty quickly here with the short honeymoon that we had that uh, you better have some strong faith and you better have some strong value systems and beliefs that will enable you to endure uh, tough times. I learned a lot about who Mike Loxley, the person, uh, is and was uh, through my two and a half years here. And uh, luckily, as I said before, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, I, I don't ever feel sorry for myself. I never want, and I do want people to understand, I'm completely accountable for the product on the field, completely. I'm completely accountable for everything that took place with the Lobo football program. There's nobody else to blame, and it starts and ends with me. And I've shared that from day one with my team uh, through all the adversity and all the things we faced, some things we could control, wins and losses, some things we couldn't, the black eyes, as we like to call it. Uh, I stood in front of that team, and I explained to them, this is part of being a man. This is a part of the process. And I do think the 95, 105 players in the program uh, we'll be able to take some great things from the two and a half years that we've spent together. The wins and losses, is, could you ever put your finger on it? Like, was it, was it something that was mental? Was it, you know, because it's hard to get over the hump when you start a trend like that, just like when you're winning all the time, that's what you're used to and you do that. Well, do you think you guys were in that cycle where you just couldn't get out of it? No, man, I mean, again, and, and I thought, Part of the reason that I was hired here was I had been a part of programs that had been through what we've gone through the first two years. Uh, at Illinois, we won one game the first year, two games the next year. Uh, that, and then year three, we kind of made the jump. At Maryland, it took us four years to get that program to where the fifth year we won an ACC championship and went on to win 30 games over the next three years. Um, so I had been through the process. I mean. Time is the only thing that's on your side when you come into a program. And that's why I said again, where the program is today is, is a systemic problem. It's not just coaching. Obviously, coaching is a big part of it. Coaching is being able to take players where they can't take themselves. But I also felt that, again, when you look at the lack of scholarships, 
the, the talent pool, the amount of players that we were able to bring in, those things all take time. And unfortunately, because of some of the things that may have taken place outside of my control, those things really cut the amount of time I had to build it almost to where it is today. And as far as head coaching again, are you going to be a head coach again? You, would you like to be a head coach again? I should ask you that. You know what, Van, it's so early for me. Uh, you know, you go through the process of, again, being, it's very humbling to be let go. Uh, for someone to tell you that you're not good enough is how I look at it. And, you know, it makes you do some introspection as to who you are. Uh, I know I'm a good coach. And as I told our team the last four weeks, uh, that scoreboard won't ever define me as a winner or a loser. Um, because the people that have taken the time to get to know me here or people that have known me over the last 20 years understand the fabric in which I'm made of and where I come from. You know, I shared with my team back in August my story, and it was a, a team building exercise to explain who I am as a person. And uh, there's no quitting me. I, I, what I've got to do now is spend the next eight to 10 weeks doing something that I haven't been able to do in 22 years drive a son to school, uh, go to a JV football game like I did yesterday, uh, spend valuable time with my family, uh, get myself back into some mental and physical shape to, 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 to get going come December, January, and then make some career decisions, uh, you know, whether it be coaching, whether it be uh, coaching in college, coaching in the NFL, uh, whether it be getting out of coaching. You know, those are all the things that right now you know, it's too early to, to make decisions on, and especially because it is still so new, still so emotional uh, for me. Um, right now, I want to just spend the time with my family and, and get myself back up to the mental shape and the physical shape I need to be to make choices and career decisions. Last question. You wonder what that is, huh? Yeah. This whole, wrap everything up. What have you learned from this? What, what is this going to help Michael Oxley with in his life? Well, um, obviously, again, as I said, I think with every experience in your life, you can take some things from it. Um, when I told the team my story as to who I am in August, I, I described it as chapters. Uh, this is just another chapter in my life. I think and if, you know, the impact that I've had and made on hundreds of kids' lives as a coach uh, speaks volumes to why I got in this business. You know, I got in this business because coaches were the father figures that I didn't have. And as I said before, when you go to bed at night knowing that it, all the decisions you make as a head coach uh, are based on as if the kids were yours. Uh, I didn't use kids. I didn't bring kids here on false pretense. I didn't lie. You know, if it's, if it's anything that hurts, is the, you know, it's all these conspiracy theories about Mike Loxley uh, it's kind of, you know, here in this state as to who I am. And, you know, the people here that have taken the time to get to know me, uh, I think they know what my character is all about. As I said earlier, I can't do anything about my reputation because reputation is what other people think of you. A character is who you really are.